Again, we are in Revelation chapter 2. When we ended our study in Revelation last week, we ended with John's vision of Jesus, glorified Jesus. Jesus was holding seven stars in his hands, and he was standing in the midst of seven lampstands. And we, we didn't have to speculate about the symbolism of these seven stars and these seven lampstands because Jesus told us at the end of chapter 1 exactly what the stars and the lampstands represented. So if you just flip back to the last verse of Revelation chapter 1. And Jesus spoke to John. He said, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now that word angels is also used throughout the New Testament as messenger. And not just a, a heavenly messenger, but sometimes an earthly mes- messenger. An, ap- an apostle or a pastor. So this could mean a- an angel like a guardian angel of each of the churches, or it could mean this is a message for the pastors to relay to their churches. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw saw are the seven churches. And that leads us right into our study in chapter 2. We're going to look at the seven messages to the seven churches. And these are really similar to Paul's letters to the churches, to the church in Corinth and to the church in Philippi. And there's something important about Paul's letters that are also important about the, these messages that Jesus has to each of these seven churches. And it's this, and we see it in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. When Paul wrote his letter to the church in Corinth, it wasn't just a message for them alone. It was for everyone that would believe on the name of Jesus Christ and be saved. So that is why we have it in the canon of Scripture, and we can glean so much from the book of Corinthians. It wasn't just a letter for the church in Corinth. It is for the complete bodies, body of believers. And we see that it is exactly the same thing for these messages to the church. It's not an isolated message for each and every church. It is for all of the churches, every Everywhere or the one true church, the body of Christ. All believers everywhere. Each message that we see here in Revelation 2 through Revelation 3 verse 22, I believe, as we look at these messages to the churches, each individual message ends with this statement, he who has an ear. How many of you have ears? A few of you. Okay. Uh, he who has ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, although it is a very personal message to a very real church in each of these instances, it is a message to the whole body of Christ. Now, almost 2,000 years has passed since John received this message and this vision from Jesus Christ. But the applications that we will find in these messages are staggering. It's amazing to me how relevant the Word of God still is. It's not an archaic book. It's living and it's active and it speaks right to our core. And there's some overarching themes that we'll find in these messages. First and foremost, that if we're not transformed by the Spirit of God, if we're not constantly growing and maturing in the faith, if we're not choosing the better thing, the best thing as Mary did, sitting at the feet of Jesus, we will conform to this world. We are creatures of conformity. It's our natural response to the things happening around us. We are prone to conform as individuals to this world and as a church body because we're made up of individuals. If we are not continually being transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit day by day, we will conform to this world. There's no middle ground. 
There's no place in life where we're, where we're not conforming and not being transformed. We're just kind of existing. We are either being transformed or we are being conformed. Also, we, we will see that Jesus is much more concerned about our inward condition than he is about our outward activity. That he is much more concerned about the character of a man or a woman than their performance. Now, do, does character impact performance? Absolutely. But we can have right behavior with wrong motives. And we'll see that this morning. That's kind of what we're going to build the house on this morning. But Jesus is much more concerned about the condition of our heart than he is our outward activity. And finally, God delights to use his kids to deliver the message of the gospel. He doesn't need to. He do, I mean, if you think about this, this revelation that John has received, Jesus re received the, the revelation from God the Father. The fa Jesus de then delivers the message to the messengers, the angels or, or the pastors. And then the pastors deliver the message to the churches. Did God need to do it that way? Is God dependent on the work of man to accomplish his will? No, but he is a kind father that says, come in, I want to, be, I want to include you. I want you to be a part of this work. I want you to experience the blessing of seeing men and women come to know salvation in Jesus Christ. But remember, you are just the messenger. You're not writing the message. You're not the, you're not the chef. I'm the chef. I'm making the meal. You take the meal as I've given it to you and you place it on the table. Don't change it. It's perfect. Don't add some parsley. Don't put a, a, a bowl of jello on it. I've, I made it the way I want it. Give it to them that way. And that's exactly what John does. And then John gives the message to us. God loves using his kids in the work, in his work. Now, each message to the church, each of these churches, really follows the same outline. First, we see the addressee, or the destination, who the, the letter or the message is being written to, who's being targeted, the name of the church. And then we see Jesus give a his own characteristic, a very specific character characteristic, or maybe put a better way, he presents himself in a very specific way to that church. There's a part of his glorified being that he brings attention to for that specific church. And why that's significant, we'll see in a second. And then he commends the church. He tells them something that, that is right within the church, something that is good. He says, I see your works. We see that phrase throughout each of the messages. And then there's a word of conviction. I almost put a, a word of condemnation, but we know that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It's a word of conviction, a word of correction. You're doing well, but this needs to be addressed. And then a word of exhortation. He calls them to something deeper, and then finally, a promise. That's kind of the outline for every single message to each of these churches. So let's begin. The church of Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write this. Now again, I think it's important that we remember a, a little bit about the church in Ephesus. And really the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a large province of Asia. It was the capital of the province of Asia. It was a large city with a population of around 300,000. And when you look at the world population back then, this was a large city. And I love looking at these cities because I think we have, especially being Phoenicians, we have a lot to learn about big city ministry through Paul's work and John's work in these big cities. Phoenix just took number five in 2017. Number five, we're in fifth place. We're the fifth largest city in the nation. We just overtook Philadelphia. 
So take that, Philadelphia. We are number, we are number five. Now, uh, Ephesus was a central hub for commercial and religious and political activity. There was a lot going on there. Ephesus means desirable. Many Roman Empire emperors would vacation there because it was kind of a resort city. Magnificent buildings. One of the seven ancient wonders of the world was located there. It was the, the Temple of Diana. Magnificent structure. Now, under God's sovereign direction, Paul briefly visited Ephesus during his second missionary journey. He didn't stay long. He did preach the gospel, but he didn't stay there for an extended period. It was later during his third missionary journey that he lived there for around two to three years. And during that time, he strengthened the church. And we read in the book of Acts that everyone that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, after Paul, his understudy Timothy became the overseer. And then after Timothy, the apostle John made Ephesus his headquarters. Now, as we read the book of Revelation and we start chapter 2, things have changed since Paul and Timothy and John were ministering there. Something isn't, isn't right. Since then, John has been exiled to the island of Patmos, as we read in Revelation 1, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That should give you kind of a, an idea of the political climate at the time. He got exiled sent away to an island of prisoners for simply this, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the church in Ephesus seems to have lost something extremely vital. So Jesus sends them this message. Revelation 2.1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Like I said, Jesus starts out by presenting a characteristic of his glorified body, a characteristic of his glorified work. Now you may say, well, isn't that what we read in Chapter 1, isn't that what John originally saw? He saw Jesus holding the seven stars, and he saw Jesus standing in the midst of the seven lampstands. Well, is he still standing? What is he doing? He's walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Before we get to the problem with the Ephesians, Jesus is already giving the solution. The, the solution is always a life-changing understanding of a particular truth regarding his nature and his work. The Ephesians lost sight of something. They lost some, sight of something extremely valuable, and that's the person and the work of Jesus Christ who he is, and what he is doing. Which means that as we look at each of these ch churches, the root of their problem can be traced back to something they forgot about Jesus. So Jesus reminds them, and he reminds them of this. I walk in your midst, because the seven lampstands represent what? The churches. Jesus says, I am here I am present, just like his name, Emmanuel, God with us. Not that he is only present or simply present, just watching from a distance, but he's on the move. He's active. This is his work. It's his body. This is his church. He is the head of the church. And that is exactly why the churches are represented as lampstands. You, you understand what a lampstand is, correct? It's not the lamp itself. It's not the light itself. It's simply the stand that holds the light. I love what Adam Clark writes about this regarding the lampstand. He says, they hold the oil and the fire. 
and dispense the light. A lamp is not light in itself. It is only the instrument of dispensing light. And it must receive both oil and fire before it can dispense any. So no church has in itself either grace or glory. It must receive all from Christ its head. Else it can dispense neither light nor life. A church does not exist to be a social club or to be a country club, or a pep rally, or a place to get free coffee and free child care, or a place to have a number of programs so we can stay busy. The church exists to bear witness to Jesus Christ. We exist to display his love and his power to a world that desperately needs to see those things. And Jesus is deeply concerned about how his name is represented. And if a church carries his name, if a church confesses that they are followers of Jesus Christ, yet you get inside and all it is is activity and no love of Jesus Christ, he has a warning. And I'm going to jump to the warning before we get to the heart of the problem. So I'm going to present you the solution that Jesus is alive and he's walking in our midst and he's active and this is his work. This is his body. It's not my body. It's not Pastor John's body. It's not the board's body. It's the, it's the body of Jesus Christ. He is the head. That's the solution. And here's the exhortation in verse 5. He says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. To put it another way, I will close your doors. I will remove your influence in this community. If you're going to carry my name, but you're not going to carry me, I will not sit idly by. He's not saying I will take away your salvation. But he is saying, I am deeply concerned about how I am represented to this world. Now, some may say, well, aren't there a lot of churches today that are are really kind of off the rails? They call themselves Christians, but... They're really not representing Christ. Well, let me remind you of the house that was built on sand and the house that was built on rock. For a second, both houses were standing, right? Just because it's open now does not mean it will last. The number escapes me right now, but the the lifespan of most churches is very short right now in America. And it's not because we're not relevant. Oh, we're trying our our hardest to be relevant to this culture. But that doesn't seem to be working. God is deeply concerned with his name. And if those claiming to bear his name misrepresent him, as the Pharisees did, he will not sit by and watch. So what grave sin did the church in Ephesus commit? What grave sin would Jesus give this warning? Guys, if you don't get this right, I'm going to close your doors. I'm going to remove your lampstand. What grave sin were they committing? What kind of sexually immoral behavior or cultish practice were they involved in? Let's look. Verse 2. Jesus says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles, and they're not, and you have found them liars, and you have persevered, and you have patience, and you have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. That sounds pretty fantastic to me. Does that sound like a church that you want to be a part of? I mean, that that sounds like a healthy body of believers. 
on the surface, it seems like this church is doing very well. The word labor means to toil. Literally, it means to reduce in strength. It's kind of, uh, the idea is pouring yourself out and pouring yourself out and pouring yourself out. And there is weariness and there is exhaustion and there is a feeling of being tired. He says, you labor, you pour yourself out for my namesake. And you're patient. And that, that word means an endurance, a constancy, a patient continuance. My uh, wife, I think about six months ago, she ha- hiked Mount Humphreys because she's crazy. I don't know why people would subject themselves to that kind of torture, but she did it with Jesse, I think. Right? Yes. And when she got back, I said, did you enjoy it? And she said, no. And I said, are you glad you did it? And she said, yes. And I said, would you ever do it again? And she said, never. And when she explained to me kind of what, what the experience was like, first you start out with a lot of excitement. You look at this grand mountain and you're like, I'm going to conquer that mountain. And you get going and you're about 30, 40 minutes in, for me it'd be three, and your legs don't want to go forward anymore. They're done. So she said at one point in this hike, every single step was a mental victory. Every single step was a battle between mind and body where you had to tell your brain, we are taking another step right now. And then you make that step. And then you realize, okay, there's a lot more to go. That, that's a good example of this patience. A patient continuance. They put their heads down and they kept going in the face of adversity. Jesus also says you cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested them against the word of God, which is the, the only thing to test against. And you found them to be liars. You took a stand for what was right. You know the word of God. And the word of God means something to you. And when false prophets and false apostles came, you compared what they were teaching with the word of God. You didn't look at them and say, wow, that guy's really charismatic. He must be right. Or that guy's really attractive. Uh, he, he should probably, I should probably listen to what he has to say. Which we do today, don't we? We are very superficial in our judgment. They looked at the content of the message and they can take, compared that content to the word of God and they found it wanting. And they called them out for what they were. And Paul warned the church in Ephesus about this in Acts 20, 29. He says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This was an ongoing message of Paul when he was in Ephesus. Guys, be careful. When I'm gone, people are going to come in and they're going to lie. They're going to try to add something to the gospel. They're going to try to change the gospel. They're going to say, yeah, this gospel's okay, but we can make it better. Let's make it more modern. Let's make it fit in. Let's make it more palatable. And the church in Ephesus wouldn't stand for it. And Jesus commends them for that. And then he repeats again, you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now, does that sound like a contradiction? He just says you have labored and you've toiled and you've exhausted yourself for my name's sake. Oh, and you haven't become weary. I love what Dwight L. Moody says. He had come home exhausted after a campaign. And his family begged him not to go to the next campaign. And he said to them, I grow weary in the work, but not of the work. Now, we all get tired. But there's a difference between being tired in the work and being tired of the work. Like, there's a difference for me personally. When I go out and I play with my kids at the park, and we spend hours there, 
laughing and having fun, and we come back home, and I'm exhausted, and I'm glad to be exhausted. That's a different type of exhausted than sitting in front of the computer screen for two hours doing your taxes. Afterwards, you're not like, man, I'm glad that I spent my time doing that. That's a different type of being tired. One's a burden, one's a joy. And we'll get into this in a second here. But where are we in ministry? How do we approach ministry? Are we tired in the work? Which is okay. Sometimes we just need rest. Sometimes we just need to take a step back and then jump back in again. But sometimes we're tired of the ministry. And a good indicator of that, we're tired of people. We get bitter with people. We get short-tempered with people. Remember, love bears all things. Love is not easily provoked. Where are we? But this church seemed to have it all in order. This seems to be a model church. What could Jesus possibly take issue with? They worked hard to the point of exhaustion, yet they didn't tire of the work. When things got difficult, they fought through. They knew the word of God. They stood firm on the word of God, and they were not easily deceived. What's not to like? And Jesus says this in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. You've left your first love. This should scare us. It scares me that you can put your head down and you can serve diligently and faithfully and tirelessly for the cause of Christ. You can study the word of God. You can have a great deal of discernment and you can still not love Jesus Christ. That's a scary thought. We can be a church humming with activity. We can be a busy little hive of bees. But when the beekeeper reaches in, he finds no honey. That's a scary place to be. Welcome to America. We have little churches and big churches all over this nation that are busy with activity. They're humming along, but Jesus isn't concerned about the activity. He wants to know, do you love me? Do the people love me? I don't care how effective your programs are. I don't care how many people are showing up. Do you love me? Because if you don't have love, you don't have anything. He says, return. He says, here's what I have against you. You have left your first love. Now understand, when he says first love, he's not talking about first in order of occurrence. How many of you are glad you did not marry your first love? Me too. Jennifer, third grade. (laughs) Sitting on the playground, she'd run by and hit my feet. I loved her. She was six feet in third grade. You should never marry a girl that can rest her arm on the top of your head. And that's where I'd be now if I married my first love. But that's, that's first in order of occurrence. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't saying go back and find that thing that you loved first. He, the Greek word here is protost. It means foremost. It means the best in order of importance. It's the same with first fruits. When Jesus says, give me your first fruits, he isn't saying, just give me whatever comes off the vine first. He's saying, give me the best. I want the best, the foremost, the first. There was a time when the church in Ephesus adored that which primarily deserved their affections, and that is Jesus Christ. There was a time when they adored him. And remember, Ephesus was a beautiful resort city. 
Like I said, the emperors would take time to vacation there in the many bathhouses. There was a coliseum that sat over 20,000 people, which was huge for their time. And they could watch all kinds of sporting events. Prostitution was legal and it was encouraged. And many commentators believed it was tied to spiritual worship in the temple of Diana. They encouraged it, but remember, only in moderation, they said. That was the culture they were growing up in. I mean, men complain today, man, it's just so easy to look at pornography today. These men grew up in a culture where prostitution was encouraged. It wasn't socially taboo. In fact, it was a spiritual act. And in the midst of all that was desirable, all that was worldly, all that was appealing, a church was born and they fell in love with Jesus Christ and he became the most desirable thing. Because they saw him for who he was. There were plenty of things that could capture one's attention and affection, but the church in Ephesus had found the best thing. A loving relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, you've lost that. You fell away from the best thing. And from what we read, they didn't necessarily fall back into their old ways. You know what they fell into? Religion. They fell into religion. They fell into activity and works. And it looked wonderful on the outside, but they were dying on the inside. So Jesus says to them in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So Jesus starts by telling them, remember. Remember. This is the path home here. If we find ourselves today Maybe doing the work, but the love is gone. Doing the work, but the vision for it is gone. Doing the work, exhausting ourselves, just putting our head down, taking one step forward, one step forward, but the love of Jesus Christ is gone. This is the path home. Remember, repent, do the first works. Starting with remember. What, what are we to remember? Think about the prodigal son. You guys rem remember the prodigal son? He went to his dad and said, Dad, you're taking far too long to die. And I'm just going to need that inheritance now. And the father didn't fight him. He gave him his inheritance. And he went and he squandered all that he had. He lived the high life for about 10 minutes. Then he had nothing. And he found himself sleeping with the pigs, eating pig slop. And as he was lying there, do you know what he did? He remembered. He remembered what it was like to be in his father's house and experienced the blessing of being under his father's home. And he thought to himself, even the slaves in my, even the servants in my father's home eat better than I do. I'm going to go home. And on his way home, he practiced what he was going to tell his dad. Dad, I'll be a servant in your home. Just let me be a servant in your home. But what moved him to go home, he remembered. That's why Jesus says, as he instituted the first communion, do this in remembrance of me. Guys, I think it's easy to forget. I think it's easy to forget the time when Jesus meant everything to us. I think it's easy to forget the time when we had a reason to get out of bed every morning. We were excited about what God was doing in our lives. When we sat down to read his word, it was like the words were coming off the page. We would read it with like our jaws open and we're looking around and we're like, are you guys hearing this? It's like he's talking directly to me. 
Or we come to church and we, we couldn't, we're so excited to be around believers. And every message, we're, we would go and, and talk to the pastor, man, is my wife ta- talking to you about me? Because this is just hidden home. No, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. And we were in love with Jesus. He was our motivation for getting up in the morning. We could not, if the church had something going on, we had to be there. Not because it was a hoop that we wanted to jump through. It was just we, we loved being with family. We loved Jesus and we loved his people. Do you remember that? Do you remember when that bitterness that you carried was replaced with forgiveness? Do you remember when that greed that you had, always wanting something more, was replaced with gratitude in the morning? Lord, thank you. Thank you for my family. Thank you for providing for all of my needs. Do you remember when he changed your vocabulary? So it wasn't constantly words of poison coming out of your mouth, but he started to give you words of encouragement for others. Do you remember that? I do. It was like God had given me new eyes and a new heart, which he did. It wasn't like that. It was that. It was like seeing the world through a new lens. And Jesus says, think back to that time. Think back to that time, a time when I was more than just useful to you. I was beautiful to you. And I know, guys, we're not comfortable with that, are are we? That word beautiful. In a lot of churches today, that's not allowed. It's too mask, it's too feminine. There are actual churches that in an attempt to attract more men to church, they won't use feminine phrases. So to say that Jesus is beautiful, that's not not allowed. But I'm sorry, he is. He's to be adored. But today, for many of us, he's just useful. He's handy to have around. Let me ask you this, guys. What if your wife treated you this way? You're just kind of handy to have around. You're good for fixing things. That that drawer just doesn't open like it used to be. It used to open. It used to slide nice and smooth. And the only time your wives would come to you is when they needed something to be fixed. You're useful. That's a sad relationship, isn't it? But unfortunately, today we treat Jesus the same way. Yeah, he's useful. But do we adore him? Do we love him? Because when we love him, remember what that looks like. Because I know for a fact, if you've given your life to Christ, if you've become born again, you have experienced this. You have. So he says, remember. And then he says, repent. This is so important, especially in our culture today. You know what repentance is? Let me put it simply. It's taking responsibility for your actions. Repentance is taking responsibility for your actions. No more excuses. No more, I'm this way because. Or I do these things because. It's a realization and an understanding that the problem lies with me. My circumstances didn't quench my love for Jesus. I can't blame the pain this person caused me for my lack of love. Jesus did not move. And you hear it so many times today. I was a Christian until God took my grandfather away from me. I was a Christian until God allowed this in my life. Well, I was, you know, I was doing really well in the faith until dot, dot, dot. No, guys, no more blame. Jesus did not move. True repentance says, I changed. It's something that I did. I got distracted. I believed a lie. I pursued something of lesser importance. It was me. It was me. I did this. 
It's not because of my broken marriage. It's not because of what mom and dad did. And again, I'm not making light of any pain that any of us have been through, but we've all been through pain. That doesn't change Jesus' love and his affection for us. It doesn't change the reality that he wants to use that pain for good in our lives if we would only let him. Repentance says no more excuses. I take responsibility for my actions and I have ne neglected the most important thing. I have neglected the Son of God. Remember, repent, and do the first works. Now we might say, I understand remember. I understand repent. But didn't he just get done convicting the church for their works, that the works were empty. So what is he saying when he says, return to the first works? Remember, what does first mean? Most important. And what did Jesus say to Martha when Martha complained that Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet? Mary has chosen the best thing the thing of singular importance. So what does that mean? Does it mean reading my Bible more? Well, the Ephesians knew the word. Now, let me say this. It's never a bad thing to dig into the word of God. But the heart behind it's very important. The Ephesians knew the word of God. Well, maybe I need to serve more. The Ephesians were serving plenty. <laughs> Well, maybe I need to root out the evil influences in my life. Well, that's never a bad idea either, but the Ephesians had done this. So what are their first works? Guys, we don't have to speculate. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 13. You know, for the sake of time, let's skip down to 17. The apostles were preaching the gospel. There are amazing, miraculous works being done. And the people of Ephesus heard the word of God. They heard the truth of the gospel. And this is their response. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. What was their first works? Now, there's no indication that Paul came in preaching that books needed to be burned. That these books of spells and, and sorcery needed to be burned. This was a natural response to the name of Jesus being magnified among them. This was a natural response to Jesus being brought close. Now, remember, it was no small thing to burn even a single book. We didn't have the printing press during this time. So every book that was written was painstakingly written by hand. So not only were they throwing away these, these books, they were throwing away books that could have been sold. They could have said, you know what, I, I don't want any more, I don't want any part of these books. I'm going to sell them and make some money. In fact, I'm going to sell them, make some money, and give the money to the church. That's a righteous act, right? Their value was 50,000 pieces of silver. That was a year's wage for 128 people. A year's wage for 128 people. So what does this mean? What does this mean for us? How does this reflect their first love? Because Jesus says, you've stopped doing this. You did this at one time. But you've stopped doing this. Well, what is this? Did they go out and buy more books? Are there more books to be burned? I don't think so. It's not about the books. It's about this wonderful act of meekness and humility. 
That's what it comes down to. Just as Jesus tells us in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We read that many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. They went to one another and said, man, I need more Jesus because I'm struggling with this. Something really dangerous happens as we grow up in the faith. Something really dangerous happens. We stop doing this. That broken and contrite heart, we think it's a sign of weakness. Man, I've been walking with the Lord for 20 years. I I can't tell people I'm struggling with that. I've been walking with the Lord for 30 years. I'm serving in this area. I can't go to somebody I trust and, and confess my sins to them. And we hear that, And let me remind you of a very important verse in James 5, 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. If there's no confessing, there's no healing. And I'm not talking about going to a priest here. Remember, God loves using his kids. It's not that someone else has a better connection to God than you do, but there's something beautiful about loving one another enough to pray for one another and encourage one another. And we hear trespasses and we think, well, I don't have any drugs to go flush down the toilet at home. I don't have any bottles of alcohol to go pour down the sink. You know, I don't have any filthy music to to go home and break my CDs. You guys remember CDs, right? They're those shiny discs. And that's what I did when I got saved. There's a lot of filthy music I was listening to that the CDs needed to, to go. They didn't need to go to Zia Records where I could trade them in and make some money and, and tithe it to the church. They just needed to go out of my life. And we look at those things and we're like, well, I, I don't have any trespasses. Yes, we do. Have we achieved perfection? We lose our love for Christ when we lose our desperation for his work in our lives. When we think we've got it figured out. And let me tell you this. You know how we know we're in that place? We become a critic of everything. It used to be coming to church and worshiping and just... You don't, you don't even know who played worship that morning. You just knew that you had time to express your gratification to Jesus. But then that, that seems to fade a little bit and we start watching the worship team. We start thinking about maybe them doing it, something different or hoping they would do more new songs or more old songs or louder songs or more quiet songs or whatever that may be. And instead of coming and hearing the pastor share a word of God and not being excited about the pastor, but just being excited that the word of God was open and being shared, we start looking at the pastor, start looking at their quirks. We don't like the way that they breathe. Someone told me that once, actually. Hey, you breathe funny. I, thank you. That's super encouraging. <laughs> if I can, could change it, I, I would. or it's too long, it's too short. We start critiquing. Wish wish the children's ministry would do this. Wish the church would have this. Guys, that's a sad place to be in. Guys, we have so much room to grow. And again, if there's opportunities to make things better for the sake of the gospel, let's do them. But it's a sad place when we lose our love for Jesus because we lose our love for one another. And instead of love suffering all things, bearing all things, not being easily provoked, we get easily provoked. Someone doesn't look at us the right way, and we go home and we're bummed. And you know what? I was driving here, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about how that sometimes exists within me. And I got this analogy. It reminds me of what my kids do to me sometimes. When I take them to Disneyland and they're upset, and we're at Disneyland, mind you, they're upset they got the blue balloon and not the red balloon. Hey, we're at Disneyland right now. Look around. 
Anybody else have a problem with their kids? That's the worst. When you're just, you spend a, a day with them just trying to bless them and take care of them. And at the end of the day, it's time to go to bed. They ask to stay up and play video games. And you say no and they freak out on you. And you're like, are you serious? <laughs> Did you not just experience the day that we've had? And God said, that's you. I've given you this church family to love and grow together and go out and be a light. And yet we pick at each other. So the encouragement that we have from, from God is let's, let's be honest and repent. That, that word transgress means a lapse in judgment. Does anyone here not have lapses in judgment? It means a deviation from the course. And that's why I think things that are morally neutral can be so dangerous. Because they're not horrible sins that we know of, but they rob our affection for Jesus. And that's what it comes down to. The church in Ephesus in Acts 19, they knew these books had no place in developing their affection for Jesus Christ. So they needed to go. There are things in our lives that just simply need to go because they do nothing for our affection in Jesus Christ. And again, I can't tell you what those things are because sometimes they're neutral. What's right for someone else, someone else can't handle. But I don't think our God's a God of confusion and I know that his conviction is sweet. Maybe we have to turn off the news once in a while. Maybe having two people yell at each other for an hour isn't the best use of our time. Maybe it is the music. Maybe it is our entertainment choices. Maybe it's just, again, the, the list is endless and only the, the Spirit of God knows. Let's close here. Revelation 2, verses 6 through 7. Jesus reminds them, hey, there are areas that you're strong in. This you have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Again, another group that claimed that they weren't destroying Christianity, that they were just presenting an improved and modernized version of it. Jesus says, I also hate that. So we're on the same page about that. And then he closes, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He who overcomes. Who overcomes? Well, John told us in 1 John 5, 5, only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God overcomes. <laughs>